Good evening. Can everybody hear me okay, first of all? Okay, good, awesome. I'm Angela Mettler. I work in the president's office at the South Dakota School of Mines and Technology, better known as SD Mines. Uh, and welcome to Steam Cafe for February and Engineers Week 2021. Uh, Steam Cafe is a partnership with South Dakota Mines, Hay Camp Brewing, and South Dakota Public Broadcasting. We've been doing uh, Steam Cafe since April of 2018. And we would like to thank our co-sponsors and everybody that comes on a monthly basis, virtually or in person. Um, I'm happy to see a good crowd here tonight, so thank you for coming. Um, and really, without further ado, I would like to introduce Tom Durkin, who is the director of the uh, uh, South Dakota Space Consortium. He is going to be talking to us tonight about the Hubble Space Telescope and its amazing photos that it's taken throughout its 20 years of existence, right? 20. Yep. Oh, 30. 30 years of existence. Okay. Um, so I will let him take it away. There we go. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much for the nice introduction. Um, and our, our presentation tonight, I'll try to keep it to the 45 minutes so we have time for Q&A at the end. And so we're going to take a little journey through the uh, universe with the help of the Hubble Space Telescope. And uh, what we'll do is we'll start out in our, in our uh, uh, solar system. And we're actually going to stop at a few planets, one of which uh, we're actually going to be landing on, hopefully, safely, uh, two days from now on Thursday with the Mars 2020 uh, Perseverance rover mission. So I'll spend a little time on Mars just because of the, the timeliness of, of that mission. And then we'll go on to a couple of the gas giants and then we'll leave our solar system and we'll go out into the Milky Way galaxy and look at some exploding stars and nebula and other fantastic images that the Hubble Space Telescope has acquired. And then we'll, uh, after that, we'll move out into the extra galactic territory and look at some galaxies far, far away. And we'll actually go to the very edge of the observable universe that we can see with the Hubble Space Telescope and talk a little bit about what that means. So with that, let's just start with uh, an actual image of the Hubble Space Telescope. This is it, it's about the size of a school bus. It's only about 350 or so miles up above the uh, Earth, but of course, it's in space. So the advantage of having a space telescope over an Earth-based ground telescope is that it does not have the, uh, uh, the burden of looking through the murkiness of the atmosphere. So whatever it's looking at, whether it's relatively close to it or far away, is a crystal clear image. And that's the reason that we have space telescopes. The Hubble actually has been one of the longest running NASA missions. It's, it's actually in its 31st year of uh, operation just celebrated its 30th anniversary last year and uh, has been just a, an, an astounding instrument. Many scientists <clears throat> claim that the Hubble Space Telescope is the most significant science instrument ever created by mankind because of what we've been able to learn about the universe from it. Um, and to put that into perspective, uh, in terms of its contribution to science, um, more peer-reviewed technical papers have been published as a result of this one instrument than any other scientific instrument or mission. 17,000 peer-reviewed publications have been, have been published as a result of the discoveries may, and the science learned by the, the Hubble Space Telescope. Not since Galileo turned his telescope toward the heavens in 1610 has any event so changed our understanding of the universe as the deployment of the Hubble Space Telescope. So we'll start at our sun, a typical star, okay, in the center of our solar system. Um, and the thing, uh, the point I wanna make about the sun is that it is an average star in our Milky Way galaxy. There's estimated about 400 billion stars in our Milky Way, our sun is just one of them. And it's very average in terms of its size, in terms of its brightness and temperature and that type of thing, the, 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 the length of its life, it's about halfway through its life, about 5 billion years old. 
Um, got another five billion to go, so nothing to worry about there. Um, but a, a very average star, uh, it, it makes up about 99.8% of the total mass of our solar system. So all the planets and asteroids and comets and everything else, just 0.2% of the mass of our solar system. Um, it, the surface temperature at, at, the, uh, at, at the surface of the sun is about 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit, where the uh, gravity is so intense from the mass of it that it actually fuses hydrogen atoms into helium. And that fuels the nuclear reactions which fire the sun. The temperature in the core is about 27 million degrees Fahrenheit. And it's just interesting when you think for a moment that absolute zero, okay, zero degrees Kelvin, nothing can get colder than that. On the Fahrenheit scale, that's about 460 degrees below zero. So when you think about it, the temperature that we live at here on Earth is so much closer to the cold end of the temperature spectrum than the hot end that is pretty amazing. I mean, you think about today's temperature, oh, it was about zero maybe today or a little bit above. Yeah, it's only 460 degrees above uh, absolute zero. But the core of the sun is 27 million degrees. And there's a lot of places that are hotter than that in the universe. So we'll take a look at the Earth as we move away from it. Um, this is what our astronauts saw when they went to the moon back in the 60s and early 70s. And as we venture toward the moon and out even further and move away from the Earth, it gets smaller and smaller in size until it really is no much greater than the size of a grain of dust. And we'll actually see an image from the Voyager spacecraft back at Earth when Voyager is all the way out to the orbit of Pluto, about 4 billion miles away. Looking back at the Earth, it just looks like a grain of dust. So uh, it reminds me of the uh, comment from Dr. Seuss. I say, murmured Horton, I've never heard tell of a small speck of dust that is able to yell. So you know what I think? Why, I think that there must be someone on top of that small speck of And as far as we know, in terms of life in the universe, the only place we know it exists for sure is Earth. That's one of the questions that the Mars rover will be trying to answer. Now, this is a very famous picture, and I always like to include this slide in a, in a tour through the universe. This is called the Earthrise image, which was taken during the Apollo 8 mission on Christmas Eve, 1968. This was about seven months before we actually landed on the moon. But it's an interesting story behind this, this iconic image. The Earthrise photograph was not on the mission schedule and was taken in a moment of pure serendipity. It's an image so powerful and eloquent that even today it ranks as one of the most important photographs ever taken by anyone. U.S. nature photographer Galen Rowell has described this image as, quote, the most influential environmental photograph ever taken. As Apollo 8 traveled outward, the crew focused a portable television camera on Earth, and for the first time, humanity saw its home from afar, a tiny, lovely, and fragile blue marble hanging in the blackness of space. When it arrived at the moon on Christmas Eve, this image of Earth was even more strongly reinforced when the crew sent images of the planet back while reading the first part of the Bible before sending their individual Christmas greetings back to humanity. And astronaut Frank Borman's final words were perhaps the most moving. There was about a billion people on Earth back on Christmas Eve 1968 that were watching this transmission from Apollo 8 on satellite TV and listening on the radio. And Borman wrapped up the message and he said, quote, and from the crew of Apollo 8, we pause with good night, good luck, a Merry Christmas, and God bless all of you, all of you, on the good Earth. The next day, they fired the boosters for a return flight and splashed down in the Pacific Ocean on the 27th of December. It was an enormously significant accomplishment, coming at a time when American society was in crisis over Vietnam, race relations, urban problems, and a host of other difficulties. And if only for a few moments, the nation, and really the world, united as one to focus on this epical event. 
So I, I really think it's, uh, it's interesting. When everyone saw our home from afar in this great image back in 68, we all realized we lived together on this one beautiful little blue marble. And sometimes I think it helps to think of that in perspective. Uh, and, and if we understand that a little better from this perspective, maybe people will learn to get along with one another a little better than we do at times. So moving on, that was an important moment for NASA and really for humanity at, at that time. But let's move on now to current events, okay? So this is an artist's rendition of hopefully what happens two days from now uh, when the, the Perseverance rover lands on the surface of Mars. Um, this will be the, the fifth uh, uh, rover for the US to land on Mars. And this is an image of the actual takeoff the, of, of the Mars rover. It's, it's called the Mars 2020 mission. And the Perseverance rover is in the nose of this Atlas V rocket taken off on July 30th, 2020, about six and a half months ago from Cape Canaveral Air Force Station in Florida, Launch Complex 41. It's, it's approaching Mars now. And like I say, it's in its final uh, approach stage. And at 1.55 p.m. Rapid City time on Thursday, if everything goes right, that rover will land on the surface of Mars. Now, let's compare Earth and Mars, if we could stick them right next to each other. You see, basically, we, often we, we, Mars is referred to as the sister planet of Earth because there's quite a few similarities compared to other planets. Um, it's about half the diameter. It's about 38% of Earth's gravity. It's much colder. On average, about 64 degrees below zero on Mars. That's Fahrenheit. Um, so if you thought it was cold last week, it's a lot colder on Mars. And uh, a Martian day is just about one Earth day, only about 24.6 Earth hours. Takes almost twice as long to orbit the sun, about 1.9 Earth years to orbit the sun because it's farther away. It can be windy on Mars and it can be calm. Mars does have an atmosphere, but it's very, very thin. It's only about one one hundredth of the atmosphere of Earth, so about one percent of Earth's atmosphere, and that little bit that's there is almost all carbon dioxide, okay? But it's still an atmosphere that we have to deal with when the lander comes through the atmosphere during the seven-minute descent stage when it hits the top of the atmosphere, traveling at a relative speed of a little over 12,000 miles an hour, it then has seven minutes to slow down enough to have a soft touchdown on the surface. So we'll, we'll see, it, see that in a little bit. This is actually just a flattened out map of Mars. And basically you can see the different landers uh, that we've sent to Mars. And uh, five of these missions were rovers. Those are the ones that are circled. They, they have wheels and can move around. The other four are landers with just legs and they just have to, they are where they landed. Only one of them is currently operating now and that's the Curiosity rover. But uh, if Perseverance lands successfully on Thursday, we'll once again have two operating robots on the surface of Mars. It's hard to get to Mars, okay? So if we wanted to have a, like a, 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 a competition between Earth and Mars, and uh, this is the halftime score, um, Mars is ahead. We've had 46 worldwide attempts amongst six countries to get spacecraft to Mars. Some have been landers, some have been orbiters. Out of those 46, 20 have been successful. So Earth is 120. Mars has 126 because 26 of them have been failures. Now, if you're a baseball fan, that comes out to a batting average worldwide of about 422. That's pretty good batting average, right? How many people can bat 400, okay? Um, Ted Williams, I guess. <laughs> but uh, uh, if you, now, now the six countries were the US, USSR, Japan, European Space Agency, China, and India. If you look at just the US success record, we're batting 739, okay? So we have a better batting average. We have been successful 17 out of 20. Hard to get there. 
can't take that for granted, so we keep our fingers crossed for Thursday that we have another successful landing. <clears throat> this mission will search for signs of ancient life on the surface of Mars. And I'm just gonna play a little video that will show you, it'll condense those seven minutes of entry into about 59 seconds so that you can see all of the things that'll happen, hopefully, in order on Thursday. Atmosphere, atmosphere pulls, pulls us down a lot. Parachute opens. Uh, after it pulls down enough, it knocks down. We deploy the heat shield. Then the same thing, then we deploy the red book office. 60 feet above the surface, it deploys the roller that is attached to the bottom. The 20 foot roll of the side ring sends to the surface, sends it to the down. Very quick uh, just overview of uh, yeah. is the, the rover behind a large crater about 28 miles in diameter called just for the crater. And this little white oval is the targeted landing zone just under five miles wide. Basically, what it is, is about three, three and a half billion years ago, when Mars had a much warmer climate and liquid water system instead of frozen ice. There was a river that flowed into this crater, and you can see that here in the positive seven uh, that, that basically panned out into the delta. Okay, so the NASA scientists, the biologists, believe that this would be a good site for signs of ancient. Perhaps fossilized microbes um, and signs of the potential that might be on Mars. That's what the rover will be looking for. This is an ardent view of that Lake Jezero may have looked like with the incoming river depositing the delta here as an outflow over here. And again, this would have been when Mars had a much thicker atmosphere and a much warmer climate. These are the rovers the, that are on Mars now that we sent up. We'll start back in 1997 with the Pathfinder mission. We had a little rover. I could pick it up and hold it. It's called the Sojourner rover. And then in 2004, we, we landed two identical golf cart size rovers called Spirit and Opportunity. Both of them are no longer working. And then in 2012, we sent up a much larger, almost car sized uh, rover called Curiosity. And that is still operating. And if we superimpose now perseverance, if it lands safely Thursday, this is what it looks like. It's a mock-up, but an exact mock-up in the Mars yard at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California. And it's being tested out outdoors here. It's not the actual one that went up. That all has to be built in an ultra clean room. Um, so it's a little bit bigger than Curiosity. I don't know if you can read that or not, but it's a little over a ton. Uh, 2,200 and some pounds. And on Mars, it weighs 866 pounds. And just a couple pictures from Curiosity to show you the level of detail that we can get from the fantastic cameras and instrumentation on these rovers. And this is a, a selfie. It's actually a composite of over 60 pictures that the rover took of itself with the camera on the robotic arm at different angles. And then that robotic arm was removed from each picture to get this quote unquote selfie on Mars. But look at the detail of the geology and the rocks that this rover is on. Here's another picture taken of uh, Mount Sharp in the crater that Curiosity is in. It's called Gale Crater. You can see the, the uh, basically uh, layer cake geology here. It reminds me a lot of the Grand Canyon. This picture of the Grand Canyon on Earth. Okay. So hopefully Thursday, that'll go well. 1.55 p.m., you can watch it on nasa.gov. And uh, we're moving out now to uh, our largest planet, 
Jupiter. Um, we actually have a mission that's orbiting Jupiter right now called the Juno mission. It's been in orbit since 2016, sending back these fantastic images of Jupiter and its moons. This is the upper uh, uh, cloud surface of uh, Jupiter with the great red spot here that actually can be put in motion from several images taken during a flyby of the Juno spacecraft. And just another picture showing the very artistic and beautiful imagery um, of the upper cloud surfaces of this gas giant, Jupiter. These are all individual storms. And you can see the cloud patterns here. And then we move on to Saturn. This is actually taken by the Hubble Space Telescope. This image of Saturn, uh, wide enough to pick up its rings, and there's actually an aurora going on in, in uh, Saturn's southern hemisphere here, imaged by the Hubble Space Telescope. Next to Earth, I think Saturn may be the most beautiful and then we had a spacecraft that was orbiting Saturn for close to 20 years. It was called the Cassini spacecraft. It's no longer operable, but uh, it took this amazing image of Saturn's rings. And this is one of Saturn's moons up here. It also took this image, which um, is of one of its icy, rocky moons called Dion, labeled rings and a pearl. Looks like an artist drawing, but it's an actual picture. Um, here you can see Cassini is almost in the plane of the rings. The sun is below it, shining through the rings, casting a shadow of the rings on Saturn's disk here, the upper surface of Saturn's clouds. And that's just a close-up of the cratered surface of Dion. And the last picture of Saturn, this actually is taken when Cassini is on the other side of the disk of Saturn, opposite the sun. So the sun is right on the other side of the disk, illuminating the rings. And this over here, it looks like one of Saturn's moons, but actually that's Earth, okay? So it, the rings are so thin out here that it was able to capture Earth on the other side of Saturn from Cassini. And then this is that picture I mentioned earlier. This is an older image taken back in the uh, 90s by the Voyager 1 spacecraft as it reached the orbit of Pluto four billion miles from Earth, looking back at Earth. And Carl Sagan uh, nicknamed this picture the pale blue dot because Earth appears a slightly blue in this picture. The sun is just off the image and it's refracting the, the, the camera lens or the lens of the camera is refracting the light of the sun almost like a prism into the different colors of the rainbow. And the white light just happened to be going right through the area where the earth is. Amazing picture. And then speaking of Pluto, we did have a NASA mission that went by Pluto uh, back in, uh, let's see, it was 2000 and, uh, let's see, 2015. Um, called the New Horizons mission. Pluto was discovered in 1930 by Clyde Tombaugh with this telescope at the Lowell Observatory in uh, Arizona. And uh, the interesting thing about it is I noticed the date that he discovered Pluto is February 18th, 1930. Well, the Mars landing is on February 18th, 91 years to the day after Clyde Tombaugh discovered Pluto. I don't know if NASA chose that day because of that or it's just a coincidence, but interesting. And this is the launch of the New Horizons mission in 2006. Took nine years to get to Pluto. And for the first time, we got close up images of Pluto. We never had them before. And I like this picture because we just had Valentine's Day and we didn't know until that spacecraft did a flyby of Pluto that this very, uh, this icy plane here on Pluto, it's kind of in the shape of a heart. And so they call it the heart on Pluto. And this is some 11,000 foot icy mountains on Pluto, largely ice, um, taken from 11,000 miles above by the, uh, Juno, or by the uh, New Horizons uh, spacecraft. Now we're moving outside of the uh, solar system and we'll get back to some of the Hubble images. This is an exploding star uh, called Eta Carina. 
that is within the Milky Way galaxy. It's about 8,000 light years from Earth, and it is created by a monstrous star about 100 times more massive than our sun, so probably one of the largest stars in the Milky Way galaxy, okay, called Eta Carina. And for some reason, this star, when it exploded, did not go supernova, where there was just a tremendous explosion all of a sudden, and, and a, you know, a, a, a lot of light given off. Um, light from a supernova explosion can often last as short as maybe just two weeks, maybe a month, you'll be able to see the light from that massive explosion of those large stars. But for some reason, this star is exploding over a long period of time. Now, Eta Carina was the site of a giant explosion in the year 1841. That's when we first saw the light from this exploding star. But of course, the explosion happened 8,000 years before that, and it took that long for the light to reach the Earth, okay? But for some reason, th this star survived the outburst, and somehow the explosion produced uh, two polar lobes and a large, thin equatorial disk in the middle, and then the two lobes all moving outward at about 1.5 million miles an hour. So this thing is getting bigger by the day, and we can still observe it with the Hubble Space Telescope. And it's, we've seen it for 180 years. So for some reason, it's, just, it's a long process of explosion uh, for this large star. Now, this is uh, the Cat's Eye Nebula. This is, uh, this is what happens when a star about the size of our sun comes to the end of its life. Sun-like stars, basically form these planetary nebulae. They don't explode violently like either Eta Carina or a supernova. They're not large enough to do that. So the Cat's Eye Nebula is one of the most complex planetary nebula ever seen and was one of the first to be discovered. It's 3,000 light years away in the constellation Draco. Estimated to be 1,000 years old, it's a visual fossil-like record of a dying sun-like st sun -like star. Planetary nebula are created when sun-like stars are at the end of their life and they gently eject their outer gas layers and form bright nebula with amazing shapes. In 1994, Hubble first revealed the cat's eye's surprisingly intricate structures, including concentric gas shells, jets of high-speed gas, and unusual shock-induced knots or cocoons of gas. Unlike the name implies, the process that form planetary nebula have nothing to do with planet formation, which is thought to occur early in a star's life, not at the end. But William Herschel invented this name, planetary nebula, for these objects. Uh, he was a famous astronomer back in 1874 when he discovered them. They looked a lot like the planet Uranus that he had also recently discovered in his archaic telescope. So he called them planetary nebula, and the name stuck. This is another planetary nebula. This one's called the butterfly nebula for obvious reasons. So the rhetorical question is, are stars better appreciated for their art after they die? Well, as we saw in the cat's eye, stars usually create their most artistic displays as they die. And the butterfly nebula is about 2,100 light years from Earth. Now this is the Eagle Nebula. In the case of planetary nebula, that gas and dust is all moving away from the central exploding star, okay? The, the star that's ejecting its, its gas and dust. In this case, this is the Eagle Nebula, which is often called the Pillars of Creation. And in this case, the gas and dust is coming together under gravitational attraction and this is an incubator of stars. It's often called, a, these, these uh, large uh, uh, columns are, are like stellar nurseries. As more and more gas and dust is pulled together under gravitational attraction, planets can form. 
And if there's a large enough amount of dust uh, to continue to be pulled together under gravitational attraction, and it starts squeezing itself together tightly enough, temperatures continue to go up. If they get to a critical point to where the gravity is so great in the center that it actually fuses hydrogen into helium, that kicks off the nuclear reactions and a star is born. Okay, and that's, so what we're looking at in this image is a snapshot in time of star formation. And you can actually see that once a star begins to form and, and it creates its own solar wind and it blows the surrounding gas and dust away. So the star appears individually, as we can see in some of these stars that have appeared here and here. If you look at the tips of some of these, you can see that individual stars are actually starting to form, blowing away the surrounding dust. So again, you're looking at the process of star formation in a snapshot. This is one of my favorite images. This is the, uh, the uh, uh, Crab Nebula. It's about 6,500 light years away in the constellation Taurus, and it is the remnant of an exploded supernova, okay? And it's about six light years wide, so the light from this end, a star over here, would take six years to reach the other end of the uh, Crab Nebula, so it's quite large, obviously. Um, and Japanese and Chinese astronomers recorded the violent supernova event nearly a thousand years ago in the year 1054, as did almost certainly the Native Americans in our country. The orange filaments are the tattered remains of the star and consist mostly of hydrogen. The rapidly spinning neutron star is embedded in the center of the nebula and is the dynamo that powers the nebula's eerie interior bluish glow. And the neutron star is the crushed ultra dense core of the exploded star. So this is what's left over from that supernova explosion that's left behind a neutron star that's lighting up the exploded gas and dust. This is another planetary nebula, much closer to Earth, only 450 light years away. So not thousands, but just 450 light years away. And this is called the Helix Nebula, often referred to as the Eye of God, because it looks like a beautiful eye looking back at us. And it, uh, it uh, was imaged also by Hubble. I just included this pretty one. This is the uh, Hubble image or a Hubble image of the Orion Nebula, which is very easy to see from Rapid City in the wintertime. Orion, as you know, is a constellation and it is, uh, uh, it's a wintertime constellation. So if you can find the Orion Nebula, if you know what it looks like, or the Orion constellation, you look at the three belt stars and a little below the belt stars, if you have a good pair of binoculars, you'll actually be able to see the Orion Nebula. It won't look this colorful because this is colored by Hubble, but you'll be able to see the white nebula very easily with, without even a powerful telescope, just a good pair of binoculars. Now we're leaving our Milky Way galaxy and we're going out into extra galactic territory. And what we're looking at here is this is an image that Hubble captured in uh, the year 1994 of, oops, of a supernova that actually was caught. So this bright light from this large star that exploded at the end of its life, creating a tremendous amount of light was only probably visible for a few weeks, okay? But the Hubble caught this image. This star was located very far out on the spiral rings of this galaxy. There's billions of stars in this galaxy. And when one of them goes supernova, it can often produce almost as much, and in some cases, more light than all of the other stars in the galaxy. It's amazing. It's Einstein's equation, E equals mc squared for the physicists here, right? So a small amount of mass, and in case a large amount of mass, in the case of a star, when it explodes, it gives off a tremendous amount of energy that we see as light. Now this is called the Pinwheel Galaxy, another uh, image uh, from uh, uh, 
the Hubble. This is located at a distance of about 25 million light years from Earth. And 25 million years ago was basically the beginning of the Earth's Miocene period when mastodons were walking North America, okay? So the light that we see from this Hubble image was given off when mastodons were walking around here. And so that just gives you an idea of, of, of how far away it is, okay? 25 million light years away from, uh, from Earth. Now the pinwheel galaxy is larger than our Milky Way, about 1.7 times as large. It's, it's, it's 170,000 light years across, whereas our Milky Way is 100,000 light years in diameter, okay? So it's a little bigger and it has probably about twice as many stars as the Milky Way. Um, they say at least a hundred or at least uh, one trillion stars, a hundred billion of which could be like our sun. Now it's interesting to see that not only do you see the pinwheel galaxy, but far behind it, we can see other galaxies that Hubble captures where the uh, spiral arms of, of this galaxy are thin and we can see other galaxies in this image here and here and several others. There's another one way in the distance. Now this is, obviously we can't get a picture of our own Milky Way because there's no way we can get a camera that far out to look back at it. But this is an artist's rendition of our Milky Way and our sun would be right here. One of about 400 billion stars in the Milky Way. So there's our sun, there we are on earth. There's the Hubble Space Telescope, about 26, uh, let's see, about 20, let's see, 26,000, if I remember right, 26,000 light years from the central core of the Milky Way galaxy. That's where our sun is. The whole width of it is about 100,000 light years. So the light from this star would take 100,000 years at the speed of light to get to the other side of the galaxy. So just kind of keep that in the back of your mind. Now, this is an image of a galaxy that probably looks a lot like the Milky Way. And this is the Whirlpool Galaxy, um, very similar, okay? So we can see that with the Hubble. Now this is my second to last slide, but I wanna spend a little time on this one. This is what's called the Hubble Ultra Deep Field Image. And what this picture is, is what, what the scientists at NASA wanted to do was they wanted to use the Hubble Space Telescope to try to collect an image of the, the farthest things away that, that, that the Hubble could actually resolve. And so they picked a particularly dark area of the sky to turn the camera toward that wasn't blocked out by a lot of nearby stars in our Milky Way that would drown out the picture, okay? So they particularly pointed it at a very dark area of sky. And then just like a time exposure in a photograph, they opened the shutters to gather in the light that would come from the farthest reaches of the universe that the Hubble could collect light from. So again, like, you know, the lights are partially out in this room. If, if I wanted to take a picture of you and the lights were on, it's the camera just go click, click, and I get a picture. Right now, the way it is, you know, the, the, the shutter might have to go click, click, okay, to get enough light so that I could see you out there. If the lights were all the way out, I'd have to go click and maybe wait 20 minutes <laughs> and, then, and then stop. So that's the process that Hubble used uh, to basically open its shutters, took a series of long-term exposures over a 30-day period. Now the area of sky that is encompassed by this picture is very tiny. Now it's a square picture, but just imagine that you rounded it out and made it a circle, okay? The area of sky that we're looking at here would be like a dime held 75 feet away from you. So I'll stand over on this corner over here and I'll shine my cursor over there and it's probably maybe, I don't know, what, 25 feet? to that wall, so three times that distance away. If you held that dime up to the sky, 
this is what it would be behind that dime. Now, the amazing thing is that in this image, we can see three, maybe four stars that are within the Milky Way. They're the items with the crisscross pattern. There's a star in the Milky Way. There's another one there. If you look around, you might find one or two more. Everything else in this image is other galaxies much farther away, each with billions of stars of their own. <laughs> so that's really hard to grasp. But when you think about it, it if, if you can get a piece of that, you're starting to understand the awesome size of the universe. Another way I heard this picture described is that the stars here with the crisscross pattern, they're like bugs on the windshield. If you're driving down a long straight road, and maybe in a clear desert somewhere, and there's a mountain range maybe 100 miles away, we're looking at the bugs on the windshield here. And all of these other galaxies much farther away are way, 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 way bigger than that. So that's a pretty amazing uh, uh, thing. And, and actually, this is also, we're looking back in time. If you look, there's a lot of these smaller blue galaxies. These are located about 13 billion light years from Earth, okay? And they are, it's taken the light that long to reach the Hubble, okay? So this is what these galaxies look like in their early stage, 13 billion light years away. Now, they're probably much larger, like some of these closer galaxies that are spiral and more uh, defined. Um, I guess it, it, we, did, we turned the light up a little bit so the light would be up, but uh, th these are spiral galaxies. You can't quite see that in this image. But um, so we're looking at things closer up, which are not as old, okay? And we're looking at things way far away that are back to not too long, after the Big Bang, okay, when galaxies first started forming. So it's a pretty amazing image. And again, it's very overwhelming when you start to think about it. So I want to end with this slide and a quote from Albert Einstein, probably one of the greatest scientists that ever lived, an amazing physicist, and really could understand things, but also was wise enough to realize how little we know and how overwhelming these things can be particularly in astronomy. So this, this is actually two uh, spiral galaxies. It looks like they're colliding, but they're actually separated from one another. And they're moving by one another like ships in the night. And the gravity of one uh, is, is affecting the other and kind of stretching out the, the uh, spiral uh, arms. But uh, uh, this is a Hubble image. But Einstein said this. He said the important thing is not to stop questioning. Curiosity has its own reason for existing. One cannot help but be in awe when he contemplates the mysteries of eternity, of life, of the marvelous structure of reality. It is enough if one tries merely to comprehend a little of this mystery every day. <laughs> so I think what he's saying is, you know, for example, when you think of that Hubble image, don't try to grasp it all, because you can't really. Just take a little bit of it each day. OK, I'll stop there and open up for questions. Thank you. Sir. Right, probably a combination of things, but um, we do have spacecraft, of course, that can, that can uh, with, with thermal detectors, penetrate um, to come up with an idea of temperature. And then also, just from our understanding of nuclear reactions and uh, the temperatures caused by, you know, d different types of reactions, we can come up with that figure of uh, 26 million. There's probably even a, more complete answer to that that I could give you that I just don't know right now. But 
Um, I, I think it's pretty well understood that of our understanding of the physics and maybe some of the physicists back here might even be able to chime in if you guys have any more to add on, on how we can come up with that figure of 26. Do you have anything more to add? It's okay if you don't, I just want to give you a chance. Right, right. Okay, good. Thank you. Other questions? Yes. Can't hear what Oh, the Webb telescope. Yes, good question. So the next generation space telescope is the James Webb Space Telescope, which is finishing its completion right now. And it's actually, you know, the, they pushed the target launch date back. But as of today, it's set for October of this year, the James Webb Space Telescope. So the James Webb Space Telescope will uh, look at a different part of the spectrum, not significantly different than Hubble, but it'll focus in on the mid-infrared range, which is going to allow it to peer deeper back toward the Big Bang. In other words, it will be able to see even farther the, uh, uh, beyond 13 billion years, getting back to close to when the Big Bang actually occurred. Um, and that's one of the differences between it and Hubble. And the other big difference on that one is that it will not be able to be parked uh, in a spot where we could go up to do repairs. Hubble underwent five repair missions because we had the US Space Shuttle that could go up 350 or so miles, dock with the telescope, and repair aging equipment. And so once we lost the US Space Shuttle, uh, we no longer could do that. So they really beefed it up in the fifth servicing mission back in 2009. And it has not had a servicing mission since then, but they really did a good job of putting a lot of new equipment on board. So as of today, we think the Hubble should be able to continue running through the 2020s before it breaks down. The James Webb is going out to one of the Lagrangian points, which is about a million miles from Earth, where the gravity between the Earth and the Sun cancels each other. There's five of those points, and it's going to Lagrangian point number two. And uh, uh, once it gets there and we can park it, it has to make a few slight adjustments every now and then to stay, with, to stay there so that it doesn't get knocked out of its parking spot. Um, but uh, there's no, no way to service it after it, it goes up. So NASA is being extremely cautious about making sure that everything is done right before they launch it. And uh, that's what's called, uh, caused all of these delays. <laughs> that's a good question. Yeah, because that's the first problem that happened with uh, Hubble. The curvature of the mirror was not right. It wasn't tested right. And when it got into the weightlessness of, of, of its orbit around Earth, uh, it was just ever so slightly out of focus. And I met at three different occasions the astronaut that went up and did the spacewalk to correct that. His name is Story Musgrave. And uh, he's, he's an amazing uh, individual. And he's been in space several, seven times. But he's the one that did the spacewalk to correct that and kind of saved NASA's butt. Mm -hmm. uh, Space what? Oh, the Space Force. Yeah, OK. How it'll confuse what? Oh, 
Oh, I see what you're saying. Okay. So yeah, the first part of the question is really what's a trillion? How can you get your arms around what a trillion means? So a trillion is a thousand billion. Okay. So there's a million and then a thousand million is a billion and a thousand billion is a trillion. And um, so it's a huge number. And uh, it's, it's, it's a huge number. And what I'll, I'll, I'll try to use the speed of light to try to make this point. So, you know, when I have my little laser pointer and I point it toward the wall and I turn it on, you can see it instantaneously, right? So for a long time, uh, astronomers thought the speed of light was infinite, but then we realized it wasn't because the universe is so big. And, and uh, so one light year is about six trillion miles. So the way that you calculate that is for the students who are watching for Engineers Week, uh, basically it's, it's relatively simple math. It's the distance at which light will travel at the speed of light uh, in a year. So light travels at 186,000 miles per second. So when I press my, my little button, it's only going 20 feet, right? So it, it, it looks like it appears right away. But it's that light, that little beam, that, that laser is traveling at 186,000 miles per second. So if that wall was 186,000 miles away, it would take one second to reach it. So that's a light second. A light year is the number of seconds in a year times 186,000. So you take you take 186,000, you multiply it by 60, 60 seconds in a minute, by another 60, 60 seconds in an hour, by 24, 24 hours in a day, and you multiply that by 365. And when you do that math, if you got a calculator that'll do it, it'll give you a number about six trillion. So a trillion is a sixth of a light year. <laughs> I don't know, there's probably different ways I could explain it, but it's a big number, okay? And that's a light year. I mean, th think about that, that uh, 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 pinwheel galaxy that we saw, 25 million light years. So it's, you know, six trillion times 25 million. That's the distance in miles. So pretty, Pretty astounding. And again, in astronomy, you know, these numbers are huge. So, so uh, that's a good question. You have to try to think of them in a way in which you could somewhat relate to what they mean. And then the second part was the Space Force. I think you were talking about uh, with all of these satellites, the Space Force itself is not putting up satellites. The Space Force is, is, is to protect our resources in space from attack. And, and uh, but what's happening is more and more uh, the, uh, uh, not only uh, just NASA, but tons of private uh, industries are putting up more and more satellites. Did any of you see that uh, they called it the, what was it? It was uh, a series of communication satellites that were uh, deployed just a couple of months ago. And I actually saw them coming over Rapid City. I didn't even know what they were. I had a deputy sheriff that lives next to me and he was just coming home from work and he rang and he knocked on my door and he says, Tom, come out and look. He says, what is this? Are we under attack? <laughs> what was this series of, of uh, satellites that were coming over in a straight line and they were uh, internet satellites. So basically it's the, the uh, effort to try to get enough satellites up there so that we can provide internet all over the world, even in places where there, there is no internet connectivity. So it, it does mess up uh, a lot of the uh, astronomy observations because you get these streaks through your images of satellites going through. The Black Hills Astronomical Society has a group of people here in the Black Hills. They're a member of our Space Grand Consortium and they have real good astrophotographers that are members of that club. And they take these amazing images of the night sky. And oftentimes they're kind of polluted with a, with a, with a satellite light going through. So you have to remove that from your digital image. Um, but but th there's a lot of concern over that. Uh, there's getting to be a lot more stuff up in space. And if that stuff runs into each other, 
it creates a lot more stuff that causes problems for other satellites. So it's starting to get to be Grand Central Station up in what we call near Earth orbit, where a lot of these satellites are. So it's a big concern, but I don't see it stopping anytime soon, to be honest. I just think, you know, you need to try to regulate it, but then other countries are doing the same thing. So you have to get everybody to agree to a set of regulations that would try to minimize the chance of impacts with too many satellites. Good question. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Yeah, there won't be, unfortunately there can't be unless we develop another space shuttle and that's really not in the docket. But uh, uh, the, the plan is right now, the thought is that it should be able to run well into the 2020s, but the parts will start to break down. And without another surfacing mission, what they'll do is the Hubble is one of the satellites, if you will, anything going around the earth that's man-made as a satellite. And uh, it still has power control. So it will be, uh, deorbited is the term, and uh, it'll, it'll purposefully uh, uh, thrust itself at the, at the proper time to go into the Earth's atmosphere to where it will land safely at sea. It won't fall on land. And so that's what we do with satellites that are still under our control, where we can deorbit them to, uh, to have a safe landing in the ocean, because it's large enough there's, there are big enough parts on it that they won't burn up. Smaller satellites, if they're tinier, they, they'll burn up as they come into the Earth's atmosphere and there won't be anything left of them. But if they're big enough pieces, they would, they would hit, hit Earth and we just don't want them hitting land or overpopulated areas. Yep, so that would be the plan. Once it starts breaking down, but they can still control the thrusters, they'll deorbit the Hubble and crash land it somewhere into probably the Pacific. Anybody else? Yes. As I recall, there's a couple of different things with that, but overall, I do believe that the the slight, uh, uh, you know, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? But the you know concave. Uh, structure where it, that it was supposed to be at, once it got up to the point of what they call gravity release, when it's now in orbit around the Earth and it's experiencing microgravity or zero gravity, uh, it, 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 it's, it, it's no longer under gravity, so it moves. In other words, it has a, it has a slight movement and it, and it didn't, it, it obscured the view from uh, you know, the light that that mirror was collecting to report to the camera was just ever so slightly out of focus. And uh, they actually had to go up and change some of the equipment to get it into the right focus, right? Yep. Oh, that's a very good question too. Uh, probably not because of the proximity, uh, both. See, again, the thing with Hubble is it's in orbit 17 and a half thousand miles around the earth. So unless it takes just a really fast snapshot um, of something in the solar system, uh, it, it, most of everything it images is so far away that if this is, if my fist is earth and this is the Hubble going around it, it doesn't matter if the Hubble's over here or over here. The objects are so far distant that that little bit of movement is not going to make any difference. But because Mars is so much closer and Hubble is moving at that speed, it might not get the best picture. But we're still going to hopefully get pictures of the actual landing from the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. It is an orbiting spacecraft. We have three U.S. spacecraft that are orbiting Mars right now. And one of them is a Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, or MRO. And it has great cameras on board. And like Curiosity, we were actually able to get a picture of the, um, of the opened parachute of Curiosity as it was going descending through the atmosphere. And so NASA thinks they'll be able to get a similar image of Perseverance on Thursday when it's going through the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. Pretty cool.
I mean, when you think about this, it's, it's amazing that we're as successful as we are. You know, it's, it's a, over 100 million miles away. And, and by the way, everything that has to happen on Thursday afternoon, it all has to be pre-programmed to happen in exactly the right sequence at exactly the right time autonomously because we can't control it at that point. When it reach, reaches the upper atmosphere of Mars, it would take us about 11 and a half minutes to send a signal up, a radio signal to the spacecraft at the speed of light because it's over, a, it's like 126 million miles away. So that's how long it would take a radio signal to get there. Well, it's only got seven minutes to land. So there's no point in trying to communicate with it. So everything again has to be pre-programmed to happen exactly right so that it'll, it'll have a safe, safe landing. And that we've been able to do that with all of our previous landers, uh, the rovers, yeah. so. Yeah, that's a good question. How does that, it has very, the, the power that's used to send back the little pings that we get from it are, is very weak. But um, what it is, is, you know, we have these, uh, they call it NASA's deep space network. And it's three extremely large receivers that are located at three locations around the world, uh, Canberra, Australia, Madrid, Spain, and uh, Goldstone, California and they're purposely located in those locations so that one of them is always in contact with incoming information from spacecraft. And so they're such huge radio receivers that, um, you know, that, that that little tiny Voyager spacecraft that's sending out an electronic signal, it's going through the vacuum of space, okay? And, and it's picked up by the receiver. So uh, again, that's, uh, you know, space is very quiet, okay, because what's out there mostly is vacuum, unless there's something in the way that's gonna block the signal. Um, you know, it, you don't need a lot of power to, uh, you know, to get the signal back. Now, the thing about perseverance, um, it has a suite of seven scientific instruments that are gonna be collecting a tremendous amount of data, not just the little pings of, information that Voyager sends back. So we do have to have more power to be able to relay that data back, um, stream it back so that it doesn't take forever to collect the data. And that's what NASA has really improved at, at the speed of communication and the bandwidth at which they can wirelessly submit, you know, send this information back and forth. Um, so those type of space instruments have a lot more power than little old Voyager. Yeah. The little satellite that could, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> Any others? I'm happy to take questions as long as you have them. Yes, sir. Oh, uh, well, that's a good question too. And so, so it, is, uh, it is largely dust, but the, the particles often are larger than we initially think. For example, like the rings of Saturn um, and rings of some of the other planets, they're thinner rings, but Jupiter has rings. Just can't see them like you can Saturn when you look through a telescope. But um, they're often comprised once we get spacecraft there, like Cassini, uh, we see that the rings are composed of larger size materials than was originally thought. So while we don't have that level of knowledge right now in terms of nebula that are outside in the Milky Way galaxy, um, my guess is that it's probably Some of the rings, the particles in the rings of Saturn can be as large as a house. They're not a moon, but they're, it could be as large as a house. Mm -hmm. To all the way down to literally dust size particles. How are we doing on time on the internet? Are we okay? 
We're okay. We have unlimited time. Okay. Do you have any questions from there? Or does there no, there I, I haven't okay. seen any questions coming okay. online, but if anybody does have any okay. online um, and you're watching on Zoom, you can do it through chat or you can post a Facebook comment and we will get your question answered. All right. Glad to see all the interest in space. So that's great. So again, keep your fingers crossed for Thursday and just go to nasa.gov and right from the homepage, you'll be able to, I, I would suggest tuning in maybe around uh, one o'clock. You know, they'll, they'll, they'll be broadcasting before that too, but uh, that would give you just under an hour before the actual touchdown. And uh, it should be exciting to, uh, to watch. Sir. Ah, okay. So in the case of a black, the, the, the one is at the start of the star's life and the other is at the end of the star's life. So a black hole is actually, uh, uh, can form when a very large star compresses at the end. So there can be a supernova, but then there can also be what's called a stellar black star, a black hole. And so if the star is large enough, has to be quite a bit larger than our sun, um, our sun would never, it's not massive enough to contract into a black hole, okay? But for large stars, they can. And then uh, your question was, oh, what's the difference between that and the image that we saw? Yeah, so that image was, was just when stars were starting to form. Our sun, for example, has a lifespan estimate of about 10 billion years. It's, it's kind of in the middle. And it's, 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 it's uh, at the rate at which it burns, it's about halfway through its life, okay? Um, but other stars that, you know, can actually go through a life cycle much quicker than that, and some take longer. But if they're a really large, massive star, once they burn up their, uh, the, their fuel, <laughs> if you will, um, they start to l lose mass. And, uh, uh, what happens is the, the, the explosions from, 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 the, from the, the central part of the star where the nuclear reactions are occurring, which basically is an ongoing process and it keeps our sun, in other words, the, the gravitational attraction pulling the mass of the sun together and the explosive force of the nuclear reactions occurring in the core of the sun, basically keep our sun at an equilibrium. So the disk of the sun is the size that it is. But after a while, like for example, our sun, it will, when, it's, when, it, when it starts to lose mass, it also loses gravity, but the nuclear reactions still occur pushing out. So our sun will actually fan out to what's called a red giant. And I think it goes out to pass the orbit of Mars. So at the time when that happens, we're not gonna be around anymore <laughs> because the disk of the sun will expand out to a red giant. But very large stars, then they can, at the end, they can actually condense in. And uh, at that point, uh, they, 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 can, they can pull in the surrounding material so tightly that there is what they call an event horizon around that star that is a much smaller disk than the original star was, um, that is so massive that the light itself cannot escape. And the thing about black holes, a little I understand about them, uh, is that uh, a single star that was big enough to form a black hole is called a stellar black hole and it would have a very narrow uh, uh, event horizon. But the, the big ones like that are in the center cores of the galaxies that pull in other stars get more and more massive. And as they break stars apart, as this, if, if my finger is a black hole and there's a star that you know, starts circling in and gets caught into the gravitational attraction of the star, it'll start you know, pulling it apart and sucking all that material into the black hole. And over time, the event horizon of those massive black holes gets larger and larger. And one of the interesting things that Hubble discovered recently was there are much more 
mid-size black holes than was originally thought. And so there's, there's more black holes than we, we, even, we even thought. We are pretty sure now that almost every galaxy has a black hole at its core. So the black holes aren't all the same. <laughs> I guess that's the, the takeaway. And, uh, and the physicists want to talk a little about black holes? Anything to add about black holes? No? Okay. Got to take the class. Got to take, take Mike's class. It's a good class. We have two <laughs> questions. Fun. We have two questions that have come yeah. in online. Uh, the first is, do other countries have space telescopes? Uh, yes, I believe some do. I'm trying to think. Uh, I'm, I'm mostly familiar with the, with the U.S. space telescopes but I, I do believe there are others. I just don't know enough to tell you what their names are. I have to look them up. Okay, and then the second question is, uh, what do we, we being NASA, do to protect satellites that travel outside of Earth's orbit from dust or particles traveling at very high speeds? Oh yeah, uh, let's see. So um, there's not a tremendous amount that you can do once uh, you know, once once you're kind of in an interplanetary uh, trajectory, uh, you're just basically relying on the fact that space is largely a vacuum. Uh, but there's always the chance of a micrometeorite impact to a spacecraft, and uh, um, the space uh, station is subject to that. Uh, we we even design space suits for the astronauts. Um, that gives some protection against a really tiny micrometeorite impact, but it depends on the velocity, and that could still uh, that could still, you know, go right through <laughs> the spacesuit and an astronaut. Um, but the spacesuits are designed to kind of self-seal if if that were to happen, so that they don't lose pressure. Um, but uh, uh, it's 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 I think the biggest risk is in near Earth orbit as a result of space junk and, and uh, satellites that have uh, no longer are under our control. They're just orbit, there's, there's no deorbiting capability. And if they run into another object, that's why we track them so carefully uh, to avoid sending up very expensive satellites uh, into an orbit that would be at risk from uncontrolled uh, older satellite parts. And there's one particular area where it's a real mess. And it was quite a few years ago, but actually China was testing some kind of a anti-satellite, I don't know what it was. Some, some, they did something to basically somewhat purposefully uh, crash a couple of, 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 of uh, man-made space objects together. And it just made a, a flurry of particles in that orbit. So you don't wanna go into that orbit because your spacecraft would be at risk. Anybody else? Well, thank you all for your attention. It's uh, uh, been a real good uh, bunch of questions. So I appreciate the opportunity to come. So thank you. You bet. <laughs>